So we're talking about acid-base chemistry. And please don't forget the fundamentals in that acids are chemicals that want to give up hydrogen. The more readily they give up the hydrogen, the more acidic that chemical is. The more strongly they hold on to that hydrogen, the less acidic that chemical is. Um, the base are those chemicals that will accept hydrogen. So the more willing it's going to accept the hydrogen, the more basic that solution, the less willing it's going to accept the hydrogen, the less basic it is. So that's by definition. And if you remember that, then um, you'll be able to correlate that definition with something called Ka and Kb. Ka is the efficiency by which it delivers a hydrogen. The more willing it's able to give up that hydrogen, the bigger the Ka. In fact, strong acids that we talked about last time are chemicals that easily, willingly give up that hydrogen. So that's what we're talking about here. Here you can see the chemistry between hydrochloric acid and water. And when a hydrogen is released, it's, got, it's basically a proton, okay? Remember, hydrogen is a proton and an electron. That's the um, elemental formula for hydrogen, one proton, one electron, if we're not talking about its isotopes. Then that proton, the hydrogen without the electron, is basically very, very um, reactive, and it needs something to stabilize. Well, what does it need to stabilize? Well, positive are attracted to negative. So they're going to go after lone pairs. That's why the base needs lone pairs to attract that hydrogen. And water is a perfect example that have two lone pairs. And you know that from the Lewis structure of water. So the hydrogen is going to latch itself to water and you get hydronium H3O plus. So that's the chemistry that you have here. Water can also give up its hydrogen if it's in, it's in the same solution as a chemical that want hydrogen. That chemical, the base, will strip the hydrogen off water and latch it onto its lone pair like you see in the second reaction, ammonia. And then what you're left with with water is OH. And the increase in OH makes the solution basic. So um, the Lowry, the definitions that we went over was the lowry brownstad Remember the Arrhenius definition was increasing hydrogen, increasing hydroxide. Well, in this particular chapter or section, we're going to look at the lowry brownstad definition uh, of acids and bases. And again, the acid is defined as any chemical that will donate a hydrogen. Base are chemicals that accept hydrogen. So these are examples, and I already talked to you guys about that. But the important thing for you guys to remember is that as soon as a chemical releases its hydrogen, then that chemical in the reverse direction can accept a hydrogen. Okay, And so in the reverse direction, the acid becomes the base in the reverse reaction. Uh, because they're connected, we call them conjugate pairs. Conjugate pairs are chemicals that differ only by a hydrogen. And that's what you will see in this next section. Let's take a look at this reaction, ammonia and hydrochloric acid. You guys know that ammonia is a base because it has a lone pair. Hydrochloric acid is an acid because that hydrogen chlorine bond is, is very weak. And so that hydrogen is donated to ammonia but in the reverse direction, what you see is that the ammonia has that extra hydrogen and it can give up that hydrogen to chloride. So we say that ammonia, which is a base in one direction, but in the reverse direction that you see right here, you see that it's going to be the proton donor. And so the base becomes the acid. And again, you recognize the conjugate. Conjugate means um, joining, okay? So these things are joined via the fact that one turns into the other without, uh, by giving up the hydrogen or by accepting a hydrogen. So in this particular case, the ammonia is co a conjugate of ammonium. Remember the difference. Ammonia, A-M-M-O-N-I-A, is the conjugate of the ammonium ion, A-M-M-O-N-I-A. I-U-M, 
okay? And then hydrochloric acid is the conjugate of the chloride ions. If you see two chemicals um, and they differ only by one hydrogen, only one hydrogen, then they're conjugate pairs, okay? So um, that's basically what I, I want you to absorb, and then you'll see the relationship between the two. Uh, here's another example. Let's take a look at bicarbonate. This is bicarbonate, okay? It can come from like a chemical called uh, sodium bicarbonate, in which case it dissociates. The sodium will be um, released. It ionizes sodium bicarbonate, and you get bicarbonate, HCO3, okay? HCO3 is a very common chemical. You should commit it to memory. Anyway, bicarbonate, which is a negative charge, can react with water and donate that hydrogen to water. And you get hydronium and you get the carbonate ion. So the, the conjugate pairs are these two. Why? Because they differ by hydrogen. And these two, water can have its own conjugate pairs. They differ by hydrogen. But bicarbonate can also react with water by stripping the hydrogen off water, okay? And um, forming carbonic acid and hydroxide. We'll talk about that later, but bicarbonate um, in this secondary reaction, okay, is going to donate a hydrogen to HS, a hydrogen sulfide ion, okay? It's called bisulfide in this particular case because it comes from H2S, and this now are the conjugate pairs. So it's easy to recognize conjugate pairs. They differ simply by hydrogen, and you guys should be able to recognize that. Here are more examples, just in case you didn't get enough. Okay. Now, um, if I give you a question like this, what is the conjugate pair of ammonia? IO minus H2CO2 minus and HASO2 minus. Then you can add a hydrogen to each one of these, especially the ones with negative charge and get the conjugate pairs. The one with extra hydrogen, you can strip the hydrogen and get the conjugate pair as well. So here's an example. If we take, um, these are the conjugate pairs of these chemicals right here. We put a hydrogen on that. We put a hydrogen on that. We put a hydrogen on that. We remove, we add a hydrogen to that, but we can also remove a hydrogen from ASO42 minus. So it can have a conjugate pair in which it adds a hydrogen, but it also can have a conjugate pair in which it removes the hydrogen, depending on the chemistry. It depends on the chemistry. It depends on the chemical reaction that you have, okay? So um, here's another example, identify the conjugate pairs. If you have a question like this, it should be straightforward, okay? Hopefully you guys will be able to um, um, write or recognize conjugate pairs. It's not that difficult. But the reason why you need to recognize conjugate pairs, not only is it in the vocabulary when we talk about acid-base chemistry is because when a chemical changes over to its conjugate pairs, then it has the opposite property. An acid, its conjugate pair becomes a base. A fairly strong weak acid, and I mean strong weak acid meaning that it's willing to give up its hydrogen, but not 100%. Okay, so it has a large Ka. Its conjugate pair becomes a weak base. A very weak acid, its conjugate pairs becomes a somewhat strong weak base. Okay, so please remember that the conjugates, because it comes from a weak acid, converts over to a weak base. A uh, weak base converts over to a... Um, weak acid, but the strong and weak in front of that is relative to its equilibrium constant. And hopefully that becomes more clear when we look at numbers, okay? Um, keep 
cutting from me uh, how do you how do you know whether to add a hydrogen or take away hydrogen it depends on the chemistry or the, the partner um, that you have in the reaction so if it's partnered with a stronger a, a chemical that is more willing to give up the hydrogen then it's going to be a base it's conjugate therefore is going to be a conjugate acid so it all depends on the chemistry to answer your question um, Caitlin it depends on what it's partnered with that that's what determines what it turns into okay and you'll see that once we take start taking a look at numbers so let's go ahead and um, finish this up here are this is a chart and this chart shows you relative strength of weak acids um, actually these are strong acids up here but down here they're weak acids and going up can you, you can see can you move the mic thing it's in the middle of the screen please oh yeah thanks I forget about that sometimes um, let's see yeah okay there um, so if you take a look at the remember the seven strong acids that we talked about well they're at the very top okay so um, you don't need to worry about Ka's for that. But the weak acids, what you see here are chemicals in which this is the strongest among the weak and this is the weakest among the weak. And then down here, they, they are such weak acid, they don't even give up their hydrogen, okay? So they're, we consider, the, consider them negligible. Now, let's take a look at their conjugates because this is important. Okay, it's basically what I've been talking to you guys about. Look at the weak acid. Now the weak acid becomes a somewhat strong weak base. The strong weak acid becomes a weak weak base. I have to say weak base to indicate that the chemistry is one in which it doesn't accept the hydrogen 100% of the time. But among if you're comparing weak bases, okay, this is the weakest among the weak, and this is the strongest among the weak, okay? So, again, like I said, the conjugate turns into its opposite, because if you think about it, in one way, if it has a, a Ka in which it's willing to give up its hydrogen, then the reverse direction, its Ka is the reciprocal. So what's the reciprocal of say one times 10 to the minus four? Well, that's going to be one over 10 to the minus four. Okay, it's not that clean because we have to throw in a KW in there, but you can see that um, there is that relationship. If in, in one direction, it's got some Ka value in the opposite direction, it's going to have a KB value and it's going to be somewhat different in terms of the side size because there's a reciprocal. Whenever we calculate a KB, we have to throw in KW in there. And that will become obvious when we start talking about um, some of the calculation. But anyway, I, I want you to understand this diagram because it's going to be helpful, especially when you start figuring out which is, which is a weaker acid, which is a weaker base. And sometimes in um, data information, you're only given the Ka Okay, you're given only the Ka, and yet you're trying to you're asked to figure out a base um, problem uh, based on that Ka. Well, there's a relationship there. Okay, there's a relationship there because the acid becomes its conjugate base, and you can calculate the Kb based on its Ka. But you have to throw in a Kw in there. Okay, so again, this is a more extensive list. And notice that all these pairs simply differ by one hydrogen, okay? That's why they're conjugates. So um, let's consider strong acids. 
again, a review are those that dissociate 100% of the time. Since they dissociate 100% of the time, that means you don't need to worry about the Ka because it's stoichiometric. Okay, you don't need a Ka for the strong acid because it's 100%. It's stoichiometric, meaning that it's going to depend on the limiting reagent. That's what we mean by, by stoichiometric. Okay, so sulfuric acid. If you have a one molar sulfuric acid solution, then the amount of hydrogen that comes off is one molar as well because it's 100%. Nitric acid. If you have a one molar nitric acid solution, then the hydrogen ion concentration will also be one molar because it's 100%. For strong acids and strong base, the hydrogen ion concentration is equal to the concentration of that particular chemical. We call that concentration the analytical chemical because that's what you read in the bottle. Um, so perchloric acid, look, search your memory bank and you'll find out that this is one of our seven strong acids. Write it down somewhere, because if you remember these seven, then you consider everything else weak. And how do you know it's, a, it's an acid? Because it has a hydrogen to donate. That's the clue. Well, perchloric acid is a strong acid. That means if you've got a 0 0.001 molar perchloric acid, then the pH of this solution is going to be three. And how do I know that? Because the hydrogen ion concentration is also 0 0.001 molar. And that's 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3. And when you take the negative log of 1 times 10 to the minus 3, you get a 3 value. That's how I know without even calculating that the pH of the solution is 3. You can do that off the top of your head if the number is clean, like 1 times 10 to the minus 3, 1 times 10 to the minus 4, 1 times 10 to the minus 5. Okay. And um, it's a strong acid. If the solution, if the concentration is not that clean, say you got 2.5 times 10 to the minus three molar, then you need your calculator because taking the negative log of 2.5 times 10 to the minus three molar is not something, maybe some of you can do it, but I certainly can't. I can't take the negative log of 2.5 times 10 to the minus three and come up with that answer. I need my calculator. But that would be the hydronium ion concentration. And if you take, um, this would be the hydronium ion concentration. And if you take the negative log of that number, that would be your pH. It's that simple. That's why you need to commit to memory the seven strong acids because you don't need an equilibrium constant. It's stuff that you already learn in general chemistry. Okay, so here's the... Um, Here's the um, solution, and um, you can see it's, a, it's got a pH of 3. Calcium hydroxide, that's a little tricky, and the reason why is because of the chemistry. If I gave you 1 times 10 to the minus 3 molar calcium hydroxide, the hydroxide ion is not equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3, because you have to look at the chemistry. And the chemistry is that you get two hydroxide ions for every one calcium hydroxide. So this is actually equal to 2.0 times 10 to the minus three. And that's your hydroxide ion concentration. And if you take the negative log of that number, that's your pOH. And then just take that, take 14, subtract your pOH and you get the pH of that solution. And that's what you see right here. Okay, oops. That's what you see right here. There's two, always think about the chemistry because a lot of times you just jump into the calculations without seeing what's going on. In this particular case, you got two hydroxides for every one calcium hydroxide. Okay, that's important. That's, that's really important. So um, the negative log of two times 10 to the minus three is 2.7. If you assume 25 degrees, so the pKW is 14, 14 minus 2.7 is 11.3. That's the pH of the solution, which makes sense. This solution is going to be basic. A solution that has a higher number at 25 degrees, of course, greater than seven is going to be basic. pH 8, pH 10, pH 11, those are basic solution, okay? So uh, let's take a look at 
the equilibrium aspects of acid-base chemistry. So now we're talking about not strong acids, strong base, we're talking about weak acids. And weak acids, you need an equilibrium constant called the Ka to tell you how well they'll deliver that hydrogen. So um, again, um, we go back to electrolytes. Electrolytes are chemical that gives ions in solution. Okay, that's why they can conduct electricity. Strong electrolytes dissociate 100%. Weak electrolytes, they do not. Weak acids, weak base are weak electrolytes. If we take H2S and put it in water, H2S is an acid, and you know that because it's got a hydrogen, and you can look up the Ka for that. But it's only going to give up its hydrogen if you have it in water to water partial percent of the time, but it does form hydronium. Because it forms hydronium, the solution is acidic, okay? The solution is acidic. And you can calculate that pH if you know the equilibrium constant. It becomes an equilibrium problem, really. And you guys know how to solve the equilibrium problem using the ice table, okay? A base, likewise. Base will accept the hydrogen, and so you need to look at the chemistry right, the reaction, and in this particular case, it's forming hydroxide. That is the clue that this is a KB problem, okay? You need the equilibrium constant for uh, the base, and if you're only given the Ka for ammonia, okay, well, actually, you're not given the Ka for ammonia, you're given the Ka for ammonium, because that's your acid, then you can get the Kb for its conjugate by an equation Kw over Ka. And that's because Ka times Kb equals Kw. That's an equation that you will see we derive later on. That's the relationship between the conjugate pairs, okay? Because we have water as a medium for this reaction to take place. So we have to, we always have to throw in the Kw for water. Anyway, um, because we're forming a base, this is a Kb equilibrium. Because we're forming an acid, this is a Ka equilibrium. The mass action expression for this is Kb equals hydroxide ion concentration, ammonium divided by ammonia. Everything here is a one-to-one -one ratio, so it's just one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one raised to the first power. In general, acid-base chemistry, uh, there's never a chemical that you raise to the second power, okay? And the reason why is because when any chemical releases its hydrogen, it releases its hydrogen one at a time, even polyprotic system. So that's why um, this is the mass action expression for, um, ammonia producing hydroxide. And what we need to do is we need this value. If we have the initial value here, then we can use equilibrium concepts to solve the hydroxide ion concentration, get the pOH, and then get the pH from that. And those are the examples that you will see uh, shortly here, okay? So let me uh, clear this real quick. Concentration of acids and base depend on the percent dissociation. It depends on the Ka or Kb. These are equilibrium problems. You need to use the concept that you learned from the last chapter. Strong acids, strong base. Please, please, please don't look for Ka or Kb. Those are not equilibrium problems. Those are stoichiometric problems. Okay, they go 100% in terms of the chemistry. That's why you need to remember the strong acids. That way you, you will know what strategy to use. If it's strong acid, you need to know you need to solve it via stoichiometric. If it's a weak acid, you know you need to solve it via equilibrium. So um, again, I give you the values of the different acids, their Ka's. This is the strongest in this list. This is the weakest in this list. That's the efficiency by which it delivers its hydrogen. Okay. Um, if you want to know the conjugate of this right here, this happens to be HIO3. This is 
hypo iodous acid then then this particular chemical actually that's um iodic acid sorry that's iodic acid uh, if this gives up a hydrogen and forms this and you're looking at the kb for that chemical then you would simply take kw which is 1 times 10 to the minus 14 we're assuming 25 degrees over ka 1.6 uh, sorry, KB equals KW over KA. So this is 1 times 10 to the minus 14, and this would be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 1. And if you can see that 1 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 1 times 10 to the minus 1 is going to be approximately uh, somewhere in the order of 10 to the minus 13. So you can see that a KB with 1 times 10 to the minus 13 is going to be a very, very weak base. So the conjugate is a strong weak acid, but the con the its conjugate base is a weak, weak base. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm showing you the relationship between conjugate pairs. This would be this KB would be in the order of about 1 times 10 to the minus 13, 1 times 10 to the minus 12. Go ahead and do the calculation, and you see that that's basically what the magnitude of that KB will be. And because it's a small number, it's not a very good base. So solving equilibrium problems. Acid-base equilibrium is actually more easier or easier than most equilibrium because you can do simplifying assumptions. Why? Because those equilibrium constants are small. And they only give you one hydrogen at a time. If you've got a polyprotic acid in which it can literally give up three hydrogens, then you have to work three separate problems. But each problem is somewhat fairly simple to, to um, solve. At most, you would need to use a quadratic equation, but you can get away a lot of times in terms of simplifying assumptions. So these are the basic strategy that we talked about when solving equilibrium problems, okay? These are the assumptions that you need to apply when we solve acid-base problems. First of all, whenever you have water and it's 25 degrees, there's always going to be a certain amount of hydronium. Why? Because water auto-ionizes to the tune of 1 times 10 to the minus 7 hydronium and 1 times 10 to the minus 7 hydroxide. So in the initial line, you can put hydronium as 1 times 10 to the minus 7. And where does that num number come from? It comes from water. That number is pretty small compared to the amount of hydrogen that is going to produce from that weak acid and so we tend to ignore it we write it down so that we say we know the chemistry but then we ignore it in the calculation okay um, a weak acid has a very small ka and therefore x is small compared to the original acid concentration so you can say that the equilibrium concentration of that acid is approximately equal to the initial concentration and I'll show you that in this example right here, okay? Suppose we have hydrofluoric acid. Again, by definition, HF is a weak acid. So if we have 100 molecules, only less than 100% will dissociate. Most of it stays in its, its intact form, undissociated form. Only a small fraction dissociates to its ions, okay? And this is an illustration of what's going on. This is a strong acid situation where say we have one molar of that strong acid, well, it gives us one molar of each of its um, ions that make it up. On the other hand, a weak acid, if we have a one molar weak acid, then look what happens. Most of it stays together. Only a fraction dissociates. That's the chemistry of weak acids, weak base systems, okay? That's the chemistry of weak acid, weak base. Not all of it ionizes. So this is an illustration of what's going on in terms of the molecular makeup. 
um, we, um, oops, sorry about that. So let's take a look at this uh, problem right here. Let me clear this real quick. Okay, so um, let me go back. Let's say that we have 0.1 molar HF. Say we have 0.1 molar HF. Then the reaction that you guys are gonna write down is HF in water is going to produce hydronium plus its conjugate, F minus. And these are all aqueous. I'll just leave that out uh, so that um, I don't uh, take up your time. Water, on the other hand, is a liquid. So don't worry about this. We can say again that this is one times 10 to the minus seven molar, but this is zero. HF, in other words, in the initial line, hasn't had time to dissociate. So that's my initial line. The change will be minus x, because some of it will dissociate. We don't know how much yet. It depends on the equilibrium constant. This will be plus x. This will be plus x. So the equilibrium line will be 0 0.10 minus x. This is 1 times 10 to the minus 7 plus x. But this is small. So we can say that this is approximately x. You can do that assumption a lot. And this is nothing more than x as well. Anyway, if we plug this into the mass action expression, we have the Ka for HF is equal to uh, x squared, that's these two right here, all over 0 0.10 minus x. But remember that we made a simplifying assumption. That's just 0.10 because the equilibrium constant is small for Ka. And so this solution is really just the Ka is equal to x squared divided by 0 0.10. And you guys know how to solve that. That doesn't involve a quadratic, okay? You can just multiply Ka by 0.1 and take the square root of that. And so that's what you see in here when I actually set this problem up for you. Okay, so let's actually do a real example. Here I have two acids. One is hydrochloric acid, one is hydrofluoric acid. I tell you what the, maybe I don't, maybe I show it to you later on. Um, you will need the Ka for HF. Okay, if you don't have the Ka for HF, you're not going to be able to solve this problem. Um, you need to figure out how much of it dissociates. Anyway, we can solve this easily. If we've got 0 0.10 molar HCl, we also have 0 0.10 molar H, H plus or H3O plus, which means that this is one times 10 to the minus one, pH is equal to one. Okay, it's not hard and you don't need a Ka for that. So that's what you see right here. Okay, that's what you see right here. This one, on the other hand, the HF is going to be a little bit more involved. And here's the solution. What I want to write down is 6.8 times 10 to the minus four. Now, let me go back because I wanna show you how to work this out. And the way you work this out is the following. Oops. Okay. First, you write down your reaction. And you don't even need to put water in there. You know it's going to form hydronium and F minus. And as I said, the concentration of this is 0 0.10. This is 1 times 10 to the minus 7. This is 0. Uh, that's the initial line. The change will be minus x plus x plus x. And the equilibrium is 0 0.10 minus x. We can ignore that. I'm just going to put x there and x here. So Ka, which is equal to 6.8 times 10 to the minus 4, is equal to x squared divided by 0 0.10. Why? Because we can ignore that x. Why? Because that's a small number. K equilibrium is a small value. So we can say that very little of the HF actually dissociate. But we still need to calculate how much dissociate if we're going to calculate the hydronium ion concentration. So that's from the simplifying assumption. 
if you do this, what you come up with is 6.8 times 10 to the minus 3 is equal to x squared. All we got to do is take the square root of both sides. And we have x, and that's my hydrogen ion concentration. Okay? So you guys know how to solve that based on your knowledge of equilibrium. That's the equilibrium table. Um, so let me show you that here. Okay, that's basically what we have right there. This is x squared equals 6.8 times, times, oh, sorry, 6.8 times 10 to the minus 4 times 0.1 equals 6.8 times 10 to the minus 5, not 6.8 times 10 to the minus 3. I put 6.8 times 10 to the minus 3 in, in my example. I forgot, it's multiplied by 0.1. Anyway, that's 6.8 times 10 to the minus 5. And when you take the square root of that, what you get is 8.25 times 10 to the minus 3. Okay. What we need to do is we need to make sure that our simplifying assumption is valid. Remember, if x is greater than 5% of the initial, then we need to do a second iteration. So we do that by looking at the difference. I take this number and subtract it from 0.1. That's the difference. And I see that this is greater than 5%. It's 8.24. So how do I do a second iteration? Well, this is my initial answer right here. So to make this assumption better, I'm going to go ahead and plug in this number and get a better value for the equilibrium concentration of HF. So I take 0.1 and subtract, not 0, but um, 8.25 times 10 to the minus 3 because that's the value of, of the amount that dissociates in the first iteration. And I get this better number right here. Okay. Remember the approximation method if you've taken calculus? Well, the approximation method is based on you do a calculation, you get an answer, and you use that answer to better your as initial assumption. Well, that's what we're doing here. Now we can solve this problem. And if we solve this problem, and generally in this class, all you need is two iterations. I won't ask for more than two. If you do two, you're, you're, you're good to go. Um, and so if you do a, a second calculation, you get an x value of 7.90 times 10 to the minus 3. And that's generally good. Now, I do the same problem using the quadratic. Why? Because the quadratic will always get, give you the exact solution. So if you take this number right here and you set it up via, via the quadratic formula, look at your final answer based on just the quadratic formula. And I'm not going to go through that because you can see it right here, but this iteration method is actually faster. But you can see that the second iteration results is equal to the quadratic solution. So generally, that's why, like I said, you can do the uh, simplifying assumption method. That'll give you quick numbers. And then if you do the test and it's greater than 5%, all you need to do is one more iteration. And that's generally good. But if you're comfortable, if you love math and you want to solve things via the quadratic, please do so. Okay, you don't need to do an iteration method. That'll get, get you the exact solution. Anyway, that, that's a good example to go over in solving a lot of acid-base chemistry problems. The other thing I want to mention is this right here. This right here. Because there's a shortcut. Whenever you have a weak acid, what do I mean by weak acid? You have a Ka about 10 to the minus 3 or smaller, 10 to the minus 4. Okay, then you can always use this. X, which is generally your hydrogen ion concentration, is equal to the square root of the Ka times the initial concentration of your acid. Because that's what this is right here. Okay, that's what this is right here. Let me erase that. X right here. It's 0.1, which is HA minus, times 6.8 times 10 to the minus 4, which is KA. 
The fact that you have a square here means you have to take the square root and that equals the x. So a lot of times, especially when you do a titration problem, you don't really have to set up the ice table. It's good to set up the ice table when you're beginning. That way you don't forget about the chemistry, but just cut straight to the equation that you end up with. And that's this equation right here. That X is equal to the Ka times the initial concentration of that acid that you started out with, the square root of that. That's a shortcut. Likewise, if you want to figure out the hydroxide ion concentration, that's equal to the square root of the Kb times the initial concentration of the base. You can do the same thing. So I teach an analytical chemistry course. Uh, it's Chem 251. And we do a lot of acid-based chemistry. So for those of you who are in chemistry or chem majors, probably a very small percentage of you, we cover this in much more detail um, in analytical chemistry. But these are shortcut equations that you end up using because um, if the calculations are going to be pretty much the same, then just cut straight to where you're going to be able to calculate the answer that you're, you're seeking. Okay. Here are more examples. Here are more examples, and you can try it here. You've got um, concentration. Let me blow this up. You got a concentration of um, this is propionic acid. The initial concentration is 0.12, and the Ka for this particular uh, reaction is 2.5 times 10 to the minus 3. See this Ka. This Ka of 2.5 times 10 to the minus, let me just see, make sure that that's correct, Ka. Now the Ka of propionic acid is actually, um, let me see, where is that? You need to find that here. The Ka of propionic acid is given as, Um, you guys see it? Oh, um, it's asked, it's the first part is to calculate the Ka, and that comes out to be, I believe, uh, 5.2 times 10 to the minus 5. So if you want to know the, the concentration of, or the hydronium ion concentration based on that uh, Ka value, then it's just, uh, 0 0.12 times 5.2 times 10 to the minus 5. Take the square root of that, raise this to the 1 half power, and that's my hydrogen ion concentration. Okay, so you can you can do a lot of these problems just going straight to that to that shortcut um, formula. So let me go ahead and um, get out of this. Here's another example. Okay, uh, you guys can take a look at that. Let's take a look at something called percent ionization. The percent ionization is the percentage of that chemical that actually dissociates. So if I got 100 of this chemical right here, change that pen. If I got 100 of it initially, let's say this is my weak acid. And let's say that I end up with 88 HA and 22 a minus and 22 H plus, then the percent dissociation which is alpha is equal to that amount that basically is um, that amount that dissociates delta uh, divided by the initial. So the delta is that difference right here, or the difference between these two. Uh, but it's basically your, your amount of uh, chemical that actually does the chemistry. This is 22 over 100. This is a 22% dissociation, okay? If you know the percent dissociation, you can also calculate the amount of hydronium ion that is produced. If you know the percent dissociation, then you can also calculate a Ka. Why? Because I know what these concentrations are. I know what this ends up being at equilibrium. 
And so uh, I can plug in those numbers and get the acid dissociation constant. So percent dissociation um, gives you the Ka indirectly. Okay, gives you the Ka indirectly. So let me clear this. So let's say that we have a 0 .0, 0 0.20 molar solution, weak acid HX. It's 9.4% dissociation. You guys have a similar question in your uh, activity. Okay, activity number seven. So if I've got 0.2 and I multiply that by 0 0.094, that's 9.4%, then I will know how much of this acid goes to its conjugate, okay? That value right there is going to be the amount that is going to go to its conjugate, 9.4%. 1% of this is about uh, 0 0.002 or, or 0.02, so it's a little under that. It's a little under that. Let's, let's take a look at the math, okay? It's point. 0188, that's 9.4%. So now we know that if we have a 0.2 molar solution, then the hydrogen ion concentration and the um, conjugate concentration is going to be 0 0.0188. We can calculate the pH from that by taking the negative log of that value. And if we do that, let me get a calculator real quick. Okay, we do that, then the number that we get, where's my calculator? Uh, hold on. Well, I can just show you. Show you solutions. Here, calculator. If you take the negative log of um, 0 0.0188, then that comes out to. One point seven two. That's the pH of that particular um, solution because that's the uh, concentration of this particular chemical. So we can see that right here, and um, that's going to be the answer, and that's the concentration, 0 0.0188 of my hydronium. And you can see that if we take the um, pH of that solution, Okay, well, you can calculate the Ka, like I said, because you have these and you can plug it back in and calculate the Ka, but uh, the pH is going to be based on this value right here. Okay, so that, that is what the percent dissociation gives you. It's another way of figuring out what chemistry occurs for, for the weak acid. This right here gives you um, information about percent dissociation. And this, this is again an example. And the reason why I show this, don't worry about its derivation, just know this equation right here. This equation right here, x, x is that over the initial, okay? Well, percent, alpha is equal to Ka over HF, square root of that times 100. That's the equation you ultimately get when you um, solve for percent dissociation. It's going to be um, this equation right here, okay? What does that tell you? It tells you that the percent dissociation is a function of Ka. The bigger the Ka, the greater the dissociation. And that makes sense because a bigger equilibrium constant means that the reaction will go more towards the forward direction, meaning that the chemical will give up its hydrogen more readily. So the percent dissociation is proportional to the Ka, the bigger, the more, but it's inversely proportional to the initial concentration. Okay, the higher the initial concentration, the less it's going to break apart. And you can think of that in terms of Le Chatelier's principle, okay? In Le Chatelier's principle, um, you could basically um, remember that this is the reaction right here. 
And so if we have a big number here, it's already loaded up in terms of the reactant. In which direction will the, this equilibrium? It's, it's loaded up in that direction. And so, um, sorry, if it's got a big number, in other words, then it's not going to go, it will most likely go in the forward direction. If it has a small number, it will most likely go in the reverse direction. Okay, that's based on Le Chatelier's principle. And this is what this number, this uh, equation tells you. It's indirectly proportional. And you can see that in this graph right here. Okay, in this graph right here, the higher the concentration of the acid, the less dissociation you have for that particular chemical. And it goes back to, to this equation right here. It's inversely proportional. It's directly proportional to Ka. It's inversely proportional to the initial concentration of the acid. That's important because now you know uh, in terms of the two factors that governs the percent dissociation. Percent dissociation, by the way, is, is going to change with concentration. Ka doesn't change with concentration. I want to make that clear. The Ka is a constant. Percent dissociation is not. It changes with concentration. It also changes with temperature. Ka changes with temperature also. Okay. So, um, these are polyprotic systems. Polyprotic systems are chemical that gives up more than one hydrogen. Okay, here is sulfuric acid. It gives up one hydrogen at a time. That's why we have two Ka's. This is a triprotic system. It gives off one hydrogen at a time. That's why we have three Ka's. In order to figure out this concentration right here, if I tell you I have a phosphoric acid solution and you have that question, in your activity, and I want to know what is the concentration of my phosphate ion in that solution. Why? Because when you put phosphoric acid in a beaker of water, you don't just get this equation. You form this chemical in the first equilibrium, but this chemical can now um, form this chemical and when this is formed, this can also form that chemical. So in that beaker in which you have phosphoric acid, the chemicals that you have are going to be certainly H+, certainly H3PO4. Why? Because that's a weak acid. So some of it's going to stay intact. You also get H2PO4. You get HPO4. Um, and you get PO4 minus three. So all these chemicals, including water, is going to be swimming in that beaker. And your job generally in a problem would be calculate all these. Good to know that the calculations are not that difficult. Okay, the calculations are not that difficult. And let me show you, um, let me clear this first, okay why it's not that difficult, okay? Generally, if you look at the equilibrium constant, these are bigger than a factor of a thousand. So what you can do is you can do simplifying assumptions in each one of these steps. And if you do that, then it really becomes uh, super easy to solve. So again, these are the different Ka's of polyprotic acids. This is phosphoric acid. It's got three Ka's. But I want to bring your attention to phosphorus acid. Why? Because you have this question in your activity. Phosphorus acid is H3PO3 right there. But only two hydrogens are ionizable. Okay. When the first hydrogen comes off, it comes off that. When the second hydrogen comes off, it comes off that. Only the hydrogens attached to an oxygen are ionizable. In other words, they can be detached. This hydrogen right here is not. That phosphorus hydrogen bond is so strong that hydrogen is not going to be released. So that's why you only get 2Ka, even though the formula shows three um, hydrogen on it. You got to know the chemistry. Okay, and I'm showing you the chemistry here so you don't make that mistake in your activity. 
only two hydrogens are ionizable. This one will form H2PO3. This will form HPO3. This is a minus, this is a minus two, and this does not form PO3 minus three. It does not, because that last hydrogen is not ionizable. It actually goes back in the reverse direction, picks up a hydrogen with water. Anyway, um, let's uh, continue on with this. Here's how you would solve um, a polyprotic system. Okay, we've got carbonic acid. We look at the first step. The Ka for that is 4.3 times 10 to the minus 7. We can just cut to the chase and say that my hydrogen ion concentration, which is equal to my bicarbonate concentration, is equal to the square root of my initial concentration. I don't have an initial concentration, but whatever my initial concentration of H2CO3 times Ka, 4.3 times 10 to the minus 7. We can do that. And that'll get you your hydronium ion concentration, at least for this first equilibrium and your bicarbonate. Why do you need the bicarbonate? Because the bicarbonate now is used in this equilibrium. For the second step, you need the initial concentration of that. Where do you get it? You get it from the first equilibrium. Okay, so um, once you have this from the first step, then you can plug it in here, Ka2 equals x squared over k um, bicarbonate. See, let me erase that. Okay, HCO3 minus, and then there's actually a minus x in here and we can ignore that if we take a look at that equilibrium constant, 10 to the minus 11. That's really a small number. So yeah, we can ignore that. And so this, Actually, if you go to the um, shortcut, that's just X, which is going to be equal to the carbonate ion concentration or the second hydronium ion. This is your second, this is your first. Okay, this is your first because that comes from the first equilibrium. This is just equal to Ka2 times the bicarbonate concentration. So you can use the shortcut equation so that you can bypass the ice table. Don't forget the ice table, that's the chemistry. But if you appreciate the ice table, then you can cut straight to these equations and solve for these problems, okay? In the end, what you find out is that the total hydronium ion concentration to calculate the pH is equal to the hydronium that is produced in the first plus the hydronium that's produced by the second reaction. But look at the equilibrium of the second reaction. It's 10 to the minus 11. Look at the equilibrium of the first. It's 10 to the minus 7. That's five orders of magnitude. In other words, this second hydronium ion concentration is so small you could ignore it. You could ignore it. You do a lot of assumption in acid-based chemistry and you do that assumption because it makes the math faster but it's based on the chemistry that occurs. And what is the chemistry? How can you figure out what assumptions you can do? Always look at the equilibrium constants. Those are the, that's the clue as to whether your assumption is valid or not. Look at the equilibrium concentration. So this is just um, some background information. You can see that I can do the same thing for phosphoric acid. And here I'm not going to really go through it. I'm just going to talk to you guys about this. This is 10 to the minus 3. Okay. This is 10 to the minus 8. This is 10 to the minus 13. Let's solve the first equilibrium. The first equilibrium is just this right here, the x squared, that's this value right here, divided by the initial concentration of the phosphoric acid, and that's 0.1. So we can basically say that x for that first equilibrium is um, 7.31 times 10 to the minus 3 times 0 0.10, the square root of that. And if you do that equation, this is the value that you get. Okay, that's the value that you get. Double check. Now, this value that you get is this concentration right here, which is what you will use in the second equilibrium. Okay, you need to solve the first to solve the second because you use the results of the first 
to give you the initial. What is the difference between step one, uh, H3O plus going to pH versus the second step? The step one, looking back on this second step, the second hydrogen is removed. The first one gives you bicarbonate. The second one gives you carbonate. Each of those steps is a different Ka. You have to treat polyprotic acid one step at a time. You can't, in other words, do this. H2CO3 produces two hydronium plus um, one carbonate. If you try to solve this problem, you won't be able to do so, okay, if it's in water. Because the first equilibrium has to be some almost complete before you can solve the second equilibrium. And that's what we see here as well. There are three steps. How do you know there's three steps? There, it's a triprotic system. It's a triprotic system. You're starting out with H3O+. plus. So once I figure out what this concentration is, once I figure out what this concentration is right here, which is my um, dihydrogen phosphate, I can put it in my initial line. Okay, I can put it in my initial line. You see how I take this number right here? And in the next step, I use it for, for this concentration right here. Okay, this concentration over here, 2.7 times 10, that's because this equilibrium H2PO4 goes to H3O plus plus HPO4 the initial of this is 2.7 times 10 to the minus 2. This is, say, z this is actually 2.7 times 10 to the minus 2. Why is that number 2.7 times 10 to the minus 2? Because now you've got a common ion from the first equilibrium. You need to put that in there. This is x. Look what happens when you put this value for hydronium and this value for the biphosphate, this will be minus x, this will be plus x, but again, the equilibrium constant is so small that you can ignore these x, you could ignore these x, and it simplifies to 2.7 times 10 to minus 2 divided by 2.7 times 10 to minus 2, they cancel, they cancel. So look what happens to um, the uh, x value, the x value, the second hydronium concentration is just equal to Ka2. The second value right here is just going to be equal to um, the Ka2 value, and that's what that is. It comes from the math because of the simplifying assumption. Now we use this concentration to solve for the third. Let me clear this up, okay, and you can see Again, what's going on? 7.2 times 10 to the minus 2 plus x, 6.2 times 10 to the minus 2 times that. These two do not cancel. Why? Because of the following. This is the equilibrium that you get for the third reaction. Okay, this is the reaction. This is going to be 6.2 times 10 to the minus 8. But this number is not 6.2 times 10 to the minus 8 because the first equilibrium, 2.7 times 10 to the minus 2, is still in there. It's in, sitting in the same solution. So you have to put that. You could ignore the second one because it's so negligible. So this is x. This is minus x. This is plus x. This is um, this is plus x right here. This is 0, I mean. And so this number becomes that this number becomes that. And now you can ignore the x again from these two equations. Why? Because look at the equilibrium constant. It's just 2.7 times 10 to the minus 2 divided by 6.2 times 10 to the minus 8. That's this quantity right here times x equals kb3. You can solve that problem. You can solve that problem. It's not difficult. So that'll get you your, your x value. And this is the hydrogen ion concentration from the third equilibrium. 
you find out that number is very small, but more importantly, that is equal to the phosphate ion concentration. So the question is, you've got 0.1 molar phosphoric acid, what's the phosphate ion concentration? You actually need to solve all three. If the question is, what is the pH of the solution? You just need to solve the first one because the other two hydronium contributions are going to be small. It's going to be negligible. And that's what you see right here, I believe, in the last step. The hydronium ion concentration is 2.7 times 10 minus 2 plus 6.2 times 10 to the minus 8 plus 9.64 times 10 to the minus 19. Guess what? That rounds off 2.7 times 10 to the minus 2. You didn't need to solve those other two problems to figure out the hydronium ion concentration. You need to solve those other two problems, calculate HPO4 and PO4, but not H3O plus o, uh, total, because the others are going to be small. That's what I mean by knowing the chemistry. If you know the chemistry via the Ka, then you can take a lot of shortcuts. You can take a lot of shortcuts. Um, so, um, this is a problem. Uh, we'll do this next time. But um, the, the next series of slides just talk about the converse. It doesn't talk about acids. It talks about base. But if you know how acid works, then you know how base works. It's just the fact that these chemicals will now give hydroxide. But the chemistry, the, the analysis are all identical, except now you're working with a KB instead of a Ka. Okay, so you need to practice that in order to um, be comfortable with basis. Um, I'm going to stop here, okay? And next time we'll talk about, um, we'll skip over base because that's important. But what I want to do next time is talk about, um, these are examples of basis, okay? I think we left off last time in terms of, um, in our acid-base discussion. Uh, and I showed you how to solve a number of acid problems. Whenever you have an acid, keep in mind that if you're producing hydronium, H3O+, plus, then that's a Ka problem, okay? If you're looking at the reverse of that reaction, acid going to um, removing its hydrogen, giving it to water, forming hydronium and its conjugate. But if you're looking at at the reverse of that reaction, then you guys know from equilibrium then that the equilibrium constant for the reverse reaction is the reciprocal of the forward reaction. So um, the equilibrium constant will be one over the, the Ka. On the other hand, if you're looking at the conjugate base that is produced and you're seeing it react with water, not with OH, but with water, and it's producing hydroxide, look at the product, it's producing hydroxide, then that's a KB problem. That's always a source of confusion for students because um, you guys are sort of uh, still weary about the chemistry that goes on. So if you have an acid, you put in water, it forms its conjugate and hydronium, that's an equilibrium. The reverse of that reaction has an equilibrium constant to the reciprocal. But if the product of that reaction now reacts with water, okay? The product of that reaction is a base, a weak base that reacts with water and produces hydroxide, then that's a KB problem. And that's what we have right here, okay? We have this chemical, it's called ethoamine. Let me uh, give you a little uh, hint on how to deal with amine. Amine comes from ammonia. And you guys know the Lewis structure of ammonia. It's got three hydrogens attached to a nitrogen. It's a tetrahedral geometry. The molecular geometry is um, pyramidal. The, the electronic geometry is tetrahedral. But this is called ammonia, OK? Once we replace the hydrogen with, say, a carbon, like uh, an organic chemical. Let's say we, we change this guy to CH3, okay? Then that's not ammonia anymore. That's called methylamine. It's called methylamine. The reason why is because this, it's called a functional group. 
is called is a methyl group. It's a CH3. It's basically methane without its hydrogen, and the hydrogen is replaced by this NH2 group. Um, if we replace two of the hydrogens with CH3, then what you get is dimethyl. Di meaning two, methyl amine. If we replace three of these by CH3, again, you can see that the, the basic skeleton is ammonia. But the, the root name is amine because it comes from ammonia. Okay, And I write it this way, H3C, to show that the carbon is attached. Yeah, do this real quick. That the carbon is attached to the nitrogen directly. That's the bond. And then the hydrogens are attached to, to the carbon. So I could have done this. OK. So this is a little bit review of structure. That's your methyl group right there. And we write it CH3 or H3C. It doesn't really matter. It's the same um, structure. But we write it H3C to, sh to show the connectivity. Anyway, this, this guy is called trimethylamine because there's three. If we change this CH3 group to CH2CH3 like this, CH2, CH3. And you guys will learn about these alkyl groups in organic chemistry. And if you're in med school or, med, or some sort of uh, professional school, you will have to take organic chemistry. But this is called ethyl dimethylamine, OK, or dimethyl ethylamine. You just name those groups that are attached to nitrogen. But again, you give it the, the root name, amine, because it comes from ammonia. So this chemical right here is called, um, it's called uh, ethylamine. Why? Because there's, we have this right here. You have an ethyl group replacing one of the hydrogen. That's why it's called ethylamine. Anyway, the, the chemistry is very similar to ammonia. And what happens is that there's a lone pair here, so a hydrogen will attack that. Okay, so um, any chemical that comes from a root um, structure will have similar chemistry. Okay, um, so there's a question in the chat. Um, where does one times 10 to the minus seven come from when hydroxide joins? Uh, the the it goes back to the fundamentals. Whenever you have water, and we covered this in the auto ionization of water, it does this. And remember, at 25 degrees, this is 1 times 10 to the minus 14. So the concentration of this and the concentration of that comes out to 1 times 10 to the minus 7. So if you have water, the initial concentration of both the hydronium and the hydroxide is always 1 times 10 to the minus 7. What happens, of course, is that uh, it's negligible compared to the amount of hydroxide that comes from the chemical. So we ignore it a lot. But don't forget the chemistry, because that's important, especially when, for those of you who are chemistry majors, you're going to need to take physical chemistry, which is 10 times worse than Chem 201, because you have to do calculus, you have to do uh, all kinds of mathematical approximation, but it goes into more details than what we're talking about here. In fact, this particular course I like to call is uh, what I like to call baby PCAM because it's it's a lower uh, concept of the physical chemistry that you guys are going to be studying in physical chemistry in PCAM. It's called PCAM. In fact, I remember that um, when I was in college, I had to take PCAM but people were selling bumper stickers that said, uh, honk if you pass PCAM. It's a really tough course, OK? So that's where 1 times 10 to the minus 7 comes from. So let me go ahead and raise this. And let me show you the shortcut to this problem. And what you will see is that if you know this shortcut and you make simplifying assumptions, the, the problem is like a couple of minutes to solve. OK, and this is how I would teach it to my more advanced class, because 
they understand the simplifying assumptions that are made in acid-base chemistry. Remember, in acid-base chemistry, when we deal with equilibrium, it's always the weak acids and the weak base. By definition, because they're weak, they're going to have small equilibrium constant. Because they have small equilibrium constant, they're going to produce very little hydronium and little hydroxide, but significant enough so that it's greater than 1 times 10 to the minus 7. So here's the trick. Let me show you first that, of course, this is the concentration of uh, ethylamine right here. And so you can set up the ice table. I'm going to bypass all that because I've done enough of these problems to know better. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this equation. Hydroxide ion, which remember is x, and that's what x is here, minus x plus x plus x. Well, that's my hydroxide ion that you see right here. Well, that's equal to the square root of the Kb times the initial base concentration. And the initial base concentration is 0 0.075. Now, I got to be weary because this Kb is not that small. I mean, it's small, 10 to the minus 4, but it's right in the border. 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4 is in the border of simplifying assumptions, okay? And then this concentration is pretty small right here, okay? It's not like 0.75 or 0.1. It's 0 0.075, 7.5 times 10 to the minus 2. So... I got to be weary about that, but I'm still going to make my simplifying assumption. And here's how I'm going to solve this. My hydroxide ion concentration is equal to 6.4 times 10 to the minus 4 times 0 0.075, the square root of that. And if I do that, and I punch this into my calculator, and let me just um, do that real quick so that you guys can, you should try it as well. That way, you know, if you're punching in these numbers, correctly or incorrectly, or better yet, you can check check my math, okay? So the quantity inside is 4.8 times 10 to the minus 5, and if I take the square root of that, I get 6.928 times 10 to the minus 3. You see this 10 to the minus 3 right here and this 7.5 times 10 to the minus 2? If I take 6.928 times 10 to the minus 3 and subtract it from 7.5 times 10 to the minus 2 because that's your assumption right here. Okay, that's your assumption right here. Your assumption here is 0 0.075 minus x is still approximately 0 0.075. That's where you make that simplifying assumption. But that number 6.928 is, is fairly close to 7.5 times 10 to the minus 2. I need to do a second iteration. So the way I would do that is I'm just going to plug this in real quick, okay? And I'm going to subtract since it's already my calculator, okay? What I'm going to do is, okay, I, I see you can't see my calculator, but there it is. Um, subtract 0 0.075 from that. And that number is 6.807 times 10 to the minus 2. Now I'm just going to plug it in here and do a second iteration. And that's all I need. In this class, all you really need to do is a second iteration. So let me show you how that turns out. Okay, let me show you how that turns out. I'm going to erase this side so that um, you guys can see my calculation. So this is what it, it will look like. Again, knowing, having the knowledge of the simplifying assumption. Uh, hydroxide ion concentration is equal to um, 6.4 times 10 to the minus 4 times this new number that I just calculated, 6.807. Try and carry as many significant figures as your calculator al allows. That way you don't have rounding off errors. Times 10 to the minus 2. And then I'm taking the square root of that. Okay. So that's the two numbers I'm going to multiply. I'm going to take this uh, number that I have in my calculator. And then I'm going to multiply it by... 6.4, because remember that's Kb times 10 to the minus 4. Multiply that out and then take the square root of that. And I get a hydroxide ion concentration of 6.60 times 10 to the minus 3. If I take the negative log of that number, I would get the pOH. So I'm going to do that real quick. And I get 
2.18, okay? You take the negative log of that number, you get 2.18, and then I subtract 14 from that. So my calculator has negative 2.18. I'm not gonna make hit the negative sign and make it a positive. I already know that the POH is positive. I'm just gonna add 14 to this, and I get 11.82. That's natural log, right? No, log base 10. Got it, thanks. Good question, good question, okay? So I got 11.82 11, 11 doing this quick iteration. And if you're, if you're fast and you're not explaining to, to students, this should take you no more than three or four minutes, as long as you know what's going on. Let me show you the, the, the detailed solution. I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, delete this, work right here. Um, and then show you, oops, oops, okay. This again is your, your standard equation, but this is how it would be set up if you were doing the ice table, okay? The, the first iteration gave me a pH of 11.84. The, the error was greater than 5%. If I do the 5% uh, rule, I do a second iteration pH comes out to 11.82, which is what I got in my calculation. If I do the quadratic, okay, if I do the quadratic on that, the quadratic actually gives me 11.82 as well. So um, again, if you know what you're doing, you can cut to the equation that you need to calculate X and X generally will be hydronium or hydroxide if you're dealing with either a weak base or a weak acid, okay? And this right here, this would be K, KB times the concentration of the base initial, the square root of that if you want hydroxide. That's what we did, okay? So um, it's really helpful because in your MCAT, I've talked to several, past students, these are typical cal calculations that you would need to do. It's good to know that there is a go-to equation that comes from the ice table. The ice table is the fundamentals, okay? But this is the result that you get from that ice table. As long as your assumption is valid and you gotta be able to recognize those clues. Anyway, I just wanna mention that because especially in the titration curve, you wanna use these equations because in a titration curve analysis, you've got like four types of calculations to do. If you're going to do the ice table for each one, it's going to be very time consuming, okay? These, these are shortcuts, uh, tricks of the trade if you do a lot of acid-base chemistry. So let's take a look at this. I won't derive this equation. I'll just give you the results. It's an equation that I've already talked about in the past. And this is the derivation. If you look at the, the reaction of HF in water, that's the reaction, Ka. If you look at the reaction of F minus in water, it's going to produce hydroxide and HF. But because it's producing hydroxide, that's Kb. It's not the reverse of the first reaction. The reverse of the first reaction is, is F minus plus H3O plus. It's not. So the fact that this is producing hydroxide right here means it's a KB. Look what happens. This is my mass action expression for KB. This is my mass action expression for KA. Look what happens when I multiply the two. When I multiply the two, I actually get, let me clear this out. Um, I actually get Hydronium times hydroxide equals Kw. And isn't this equation and this equation equal to Ka times Kb? Therefore, this is just Ka times Kb. That's the relationship between the acid dissociation constant and the base dissociation constant, the conjugate of that acid. You use that a lot. And remember, the Kb is based on that conjugate forming hydroxide. It's not the reverse of that reaction. The reverse of that reaction, the Ka for that, or the, the Ka prime for that is just one over 
3.5 times 10 to the minus four because it's the reverse of that reaction without modifying it. Okay, so hopefully that's clear based on what we've talked about in the past. Okay, these two are not reverse of each other. One, they're both reacting with water. One's producing hydro hydronium, the other one's producing hydroxide, but they are related to water, Kw, by this equation right here. Okay, so um, you're gonna be using, that's another, like put any in your equation page that because you will be using that a lot. Uh, let's take a look at amphoteric system. Amphoteric systems are chemical that will act both as an acid and as a base. In other words, a chemical that will both donate its hydrogen and accept a hydrogen at the same time. And you might say, well, that's kind of weird, but these chemicals are sort of schizophrenic in terms of they don't know what to do. It depends on what is bumping up against them. Okay, so amphoteric system, you've already seen the most common amphoteric system, water. Water can, um, accept a hydrogen, and when it accepts a hydrogen, it forms hydronium, or it can gives up, give up its hydrogen, and when it gives up its hydrogen, it forms hydroxide. That's a classic example of an amphoteric uh, chemical. It has dual properties, okay? And most chemicals that have more than one hydrogen uh, in there somewhere is an amphoteric substance. Chemical like bicarbonate. Bicarbonate comes from carbonic acid. Carbonic acid itself is not amphoteric. And the reason why carbonic acid is not amphoteric is because it can't accept another hydrogen. It will give up hydrogen, but it can't accept another hydrogen. But suppose this thing gives up a hydrogen and now becomes bicarbonate. Okay, this is carbonic acid. This is bicarbonate. Now, Bicarbonate, on the other hand, can give up that other hydrogen or it can take in another hydrogen and form back carbonic acid. So that's an amphoteric uh, chemical. It can give up its extra hydrogen that it has or because it's lost that hydrogen, it can gain it back. Why can't it gain it back? Because it's a weak acid. By definition, a weak acid will release its hydrogen and take back its hydrogen. It's in an equilibrium state, okay? So bicarbonate is an amphoteric chemical. Let's take a look at phosphoric acid. Phosphoric acid itself is not amphoteric, but dihydrogen phosphate, that's this guy right here, is amphoteric. It can either gain back the hydrogen it lost or it can lose that second hydrogen and do this. So this is amphoteric. This also is amphoteric. It can gain the hydrogen it just lost or lose that other hydrogen. And you get this. PO4, however, is not amphoteric. The only chemistry available for PO4 minus three is gaining a hydrogen. So that's a base. This is a strictly a base. This is strictly an acid, albeit a weak acid, albeit a weak base. This can be an acid or a base depending on the situation. This can be an acid or a base depending on the situation. It's amphoteric. Okay, so um, let me clear this. That's uh, basically what we have right here. Okay, if we look at carbonic acid, the first hydrogen comes off in the tune of 4.3 times 10 to the minus seven. The second one's much more difficult to come off by the smaller equilibrium constant, but it can come off. It's 5.6 times 10 to the minus 11. Okay, 5.6 times 10 minus 11. The second hydrogen coming off on any polyprotic chemical will always have a lower equilibrium. Okay, it's much more difficult to remove the second one. Not that you can't remove it, it's just that much more difficult. Why? Because when you remove the first hydrogen, it now has a negative, and then the second hydrogen that comes off, you're removing it from an anion, okay? You're removing a positive cation hydrogen from an anion that formed from the previous reaction. It's much more difficult to do that. That's why second, third, 
equilibrium constant for the same polyprotic system is always going to be smaller. How small? It depends on the chemical. Okay, it could be two orders of magnitude. It could be four orders of magnitude. When I say orders, I mean like 10 to the minus three all the way to 10 to the minus eight. That right there is five orders of magnitude. Okay, that's how mathemat mathematicians explain the size of numbers, the magnitude, and it's basically the, the factors of 10. So um, this is the acid process is when the chemical loses hydrogen, but now that chemical, let's say we have carbonate ion, can now gain hydrogen from say water, because remember water can donate and you get bicarbonate and then it can gain another hydrogen and you can get carbonic acid. So all of these are equilibrium. This will go in the forward direction, this will go um, in the forward direction, but this now can go in the reverse direction or in the direction in which it produces hydroxide. If you take these two numbers right here, this is the first hydrogen coming off and this is the, um, let me just see, uh, this number and you see this right here and this right here, these two reactions, let me clear this up. Okay, let me clear this up. These two reactions, are basically the inverse of each other via the, the one is producing hydronium, the other one's producing hydroxide. Okay, so these two, this is a Ka because it's producing hydronium. This is a Kb because it's producing hydroxide. But if you multiply these two out, guess what? That's equal to Kw, one times 10 to the minus 14. Why is that so? Because these are conjugate pairs, okay? These two reactions, when you multiply them out, they're going to be equal to one times 10 to the minus 14. Why? Because these are conjugate pairs. So conjugate pairs, uh, they're related by Ka times Kb equals Kw. So let me try and put this in, in terms of a visual. This is a chemical that you have in your kitchen, baking soda. And so what I, I will do is I'm going to take a beaker of water and I'm going to put Arm & Hammer baking soda in here. And Arm & Hammer baking soda, the, the formula is NaHCO3, okay? So you're introducing bicarbonate. And the sodium is just going to be floating around. It's going to be a spectator. But in here, you've got bicarbonate. That's the main chemical that's in your water. And the question is, if I put baking soda in water, is that solution acidic or basic? Will the pH of that solution at 25 degrees be less than 25, which makes it, sorry, less than 7, which makes it acidic, or greater than 7, which makes it acidic? And all you, you have, and it's a solid. So if you have a solid, you don't really have a concentration, but you do have, depending on how much uh, solid you have, okay? Remember, this is 100% soluble in water. Why? Because you got sodium right there. And uh, group one salts are soluble in water. If I put that in and I have a certain mass, then you can calculate the number of moles of that sodium bicarbonate. And then depending on how much water I have, you can calculate a concentration. You guys know how to do that. You, you did that in CHEM 200. So if I have sodium bicarbonate, I know the mass that I put into water. I know the volume of the water. You can calculate the concentration, okay? But I'm asking you more of a, not a quantitative, a qualitative question, okay? A yes, no answer. Is the solution acidic or basic? And if you work with baking soda or you work in a lab, you know that baking soda is used to clean up acid spills. And that's because it's basic. OK, 
Okay, it's basic. So this solution, if I put it in water, it's going to have a pH greater than 7. But how could you recognize that from this equation? This is carbonic acid. The Ka for that is 4.3 times 10 to the minus 7. The, this is bicarbonate. The Ka2 for that is 5.6 times 10 to the minus 11. You can find this in your book or in the lab manual. This is carbonate ion. The Kb for that is 1.79 times 10 to the minus 4. If you multiply both of these, it's 1 times 10 to the minus 14. That's the relationship. You can't take this chemical and this chemical and multiply this Ka and get this Kb. It has to come from this Ka right here because these are the conjugate pairs. Okay, it's only conjugate pairs that are related by Ka times Kb equals Kw. Now that I have bicarbonate, bicarbonate can also back react with water. And this is my Kb, 2.33 times 10 to minus 8. So let me clear this up again. I write too much. Okay, let me clear this up again. Because I really want to make a point here. So this is the chemical that is in your water. And these are the reactions available. The reactions available to this guy is this reaction going to bi carbonic acid and this reaction going to bicarbonate or carbonate ions. Remember I told you the chemistry is always found in the equilibrium constant? Well, which equilibrium constant is bigger? The one that leads back to the acid or the one that leads to um, the conjugate base of that ke chemical, carbonate or carbonic acid. Well, take a look. One is 5.6 times 10 to the minus 11. The other one's 2.33 times 10 to the minus 8. Definitely 2.33 times 10 to the minus 8 is a bigger number. This chemical is going to form back carbonic acid, but the chemistry is the following. HCO3 minus plus water don't look at the fact that you form carbonic acid, okay, and get fooled that the solution therefore is acidic. The chemistry is with water. When you form carbonic acid, you form hydroxide. That's why the solution is basic, because you're forming hydroxide, that chemical which directly leads to the pH of the solution, okay. Again, it's about the chemistry. And hopefully you can see what's going on here. This guy will give you carbonate ion. That equilibrium exists. But it gives you, to a greater degree, carbonic acid. And in the, the process of forming carbonic acid, it produces more hydroxide. It produces more hydroxide. That's why the solution is basic. Okay. So let me clear this. And uh, you, do, you can do that argument as well for all these salts because the sodium or the potassium in each one of these, not the ammonia, okay? We have to save that for a special question. But the potassium, the sodium, they're spectators. They don't react with water to give you any other reaction, okay? Hydrogen sulfide, though, can do this or do this. And you would need to know the Ka for that and the Kb for that to figure out whether the solution is acidic or basic. Okay, And you don't have to do any calculations. You just have to find or Maybe you do have to do some calculations. Maybe you do have to calculate the Ka and the Kb. But usually these are found in tables and just compare which one is bigger. The one that is a bigger number is also the one that's going to be more efficient. It's going to want be the reaction that is the dominant reaction. And then it's the reaction that will um, lead to your the answer. Is it acidic or basic? Okay. So that's what I want. I wanted to cover in terms of am, amphoteric. Okay, amphoteric. Now this right here is a special pro problem right there. Why? Because ammonium. This is this is a problem in itself. Um, 
do that. Ammonium, we'll do this. You have to look at all the reaction that are possible. Um, bicarbonate, that's what this is. We'll do this. Or you can do this. So this 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 particular problem is actually three problems in one. Okay, three problems in one. This problem right here is two problems in one in that you have to calculate this equilibrium and this equilibrium. Calculate the amount of hydrogen here and the amount of hydroxide there if you want to figure out what the pH of the solution happens to be. And that's what I have in this next question. Okay, I have 42 grams of sodium bicarbonate and 500 milliliters of water. What is the pH of the solution? So let me walk, walk you through this real quick. First thing I will do is I'm just going to look at these reactions, the one that is leading to hydroxide and the one that's leading to carbonate ion, because those are the only two reactions that I need to pay attention to, because the main uh, actor in the solution is bicarbonate. So those are the two different pathways. So um, what I could do now is I can do my quick shortcut that is always handy. I can do this right here because I know this concentration. When I have 42 grams of, of um, sodium bicarbonate, that actually is, um, I think, one mole. Okay, because if you look at the molar mass of sodium bicarbonate, sodium's about 23, carbon is 12. Actually, that's about uh, 42 is 0.5 moles. Okay, 0.5 moles uh, because if you add 48, which is 3 oxygen, 12, 23, and 1, that's about um, 82 grams per mole. And 42 is half of that, so that's 0.5 moles. In 500 milliliters, that's 0.5 liters. This is a one molar solution. I give you clean numbers like that, so it's easier to do. If this is a one molar solution, then it's one molar in bicarbonate. Okay, so. Um, you can easily do that shortcut and multiply one molar by that and take the square root to get the hydroxide ion concentration. You can take one molar and multiply it by that, take the square root, and um, that'll get you the hydroxide ion concentration. And then know that when you have hydronium and hydroxide present in the same solution, they'll neutralize each other and form water. Whichever is in excess, is going to dictate the pH of that solution. So um, that's what happens in this particular problem. You will calculate whichever is in excess and you'll find out that the hydronium is in excess. Calculate that excess, take the negative log of that and you've got the pH of that solution, okay? So, so that's how you would work uh, this type of problem. Uh, the last thing, well, this is another topic that is also covered in this particular section. We're switching gears here, is solubility. And if I have barium fluoride, barium fluoride is a salt. And you might take a look at it and say, okay, there's a barium cation and a fluoride anion. But did you know that this particular chemical can, if you put it in water, will change the pH of the water Okay, if you put sodium chloride in water, it shouldn't change that pH. Okay, because the sodium will not react with water and the chlorine will not react with water. But in this particular chemical, barium fluoride, it's going to break up to fluoride ions and barium. Barium is a spectator, but the fluoride ions can do two things. It can either uh, react with water and form HF and hydroxide, or it can um, no, that's the only thing it can do. It can basically strip a hydrogen from water. It's, it's got no hydrogen to deliver. So, so nothing's going to happen with F minus. F minus is just basically a base. So this chemical right here is a base and it comes from the salt of barium fluoride. So the question really is, how can I increase or decrease the solubility of this chemical 
by changing the pH of the solution. First of all, the fact that it forms hydroxide means that if you put this salt in water, it's going to be uh, give you a pH greater than seven. It's going to be basic. But if I want to get more of this dissolve, do I make the solution more basic or more acidic? And it goes back to Le Chatelier's principle. Okay, so we're having this chemical. This chemical will react with water to form hydroxide. Okay, and uh, HF. So look what happens if you take that chemical. Let's say we have this chemical. It's barium plus two and fluoride ion in here. So we basically put a solid in there and we want more of it to go into solution. Well, to, to have more of it go in solution, we got to push this equilibrium to the right. The way we push that equilibrium to the right is push this equilibrium right here to the right. By pushing this equilibrium to the right, the secondary reaction, and you guys have seen a lot of secondary reaction because you did experiment number three, okay? Equilibrium reactions. So this is a secondary reaction. This is a reaction that doesn't, is not the main reaction right here, but affects a chemical that is involved in that main reaction, namely fluoride. So if we add, say, if we make the sol solution more acidic, make the solution more acidic, guess what happens to the hydroxide? The hydroxide will react with that acid, form water, and it's gonna cause this equilibrium to shift to the right because you're depleting hydroxide. In the process of pushing this reaction to the right and depleting hydroxide, you're also depleting fluoride because it needs to get used up, okay? Remember, Le Chatelier's principle, you're removing a product the reactant has to make up that, that product. The reaction shifts to the right. Well, by depleting the fluoride, you actually affect that fluoride in the main reaction and also decrease it. Therefore, the equilibrium is going to go to the right. Therefore, more of it is going to dissolve. We increase the solubility. So we can say that for this particular salt, we can increase the solubility by making the solution more acidic. We can decrease the solubility by just doing the opposite. By doing the opposite, okay, we, we make the solution more basic. So we add more hydroxide here. So we're loading the product in the secondary reaction with hydroxide. Guess what? The equilibrium now is going to shift to the left, producing more fluoride because it has to chew up the HF that forms. Okay, you got more hydroxide, more products. It's got to shift the equilibrium to the left. You're producing more fluoride now. More fluoride in that primary reaction is going to shift the equilibrium to the left here. You're going to get more barium fluoride precipitating out. So depending on the identity of your salt, if the ions in your salt are the conjugates of weak acids or the conjugates of weak base, then you can change the solubility Remember the chemical that goes into solution into its ions? You can change the solubility by adjusting the pH of that solution. So that's what this whole uh, section's about, um, affecting solubility by pH changes. So that, that's um, the discussion that you see right here. Okay, so what I just talked to you about, the, these are the uh, narrative. Likewise, this would be the opposite. When you load the reaction with base, you decrease the solubility. So I just wanted to get that in there because that's an important bar, part of um, this particular section. Um, let's take a look at this section right here, okay? We have a bunch of ions and the question is, the question that you'll find in your homework is, I'll give you, sorry, um, it's not quite what I want. So it's not the um, equation that I want. Okay. And the reason why is because uh, here it is. Okay. Let's take a look at this right here. I had the wrong slide. The question that you will see a lot in your homework is they'll give you a reaction and they'll ask you, 
which is the dominant species in solution? Or they'll give you a chemical in water, H2S, and they'll ask, well, if you have a beaker of H2S, this H2S is going to spit out a hydrogen and form HS. But because you have water, you also have hydroxide. So um, what happens is that this is the main reaction that occurs. And the question is, which chemical is the dominant species in, in the solution, excluding water? Because water is definitely going to be the dominant. But which is the dominant chemical in solution? Is it H2S, H3O, or HS? That's the question. OK. Uh, I'll give you another example. Let's take a look at this. I've got dihydrogen phosphate. And I can produce dihydrogen phosphate by introducing it as sodium dihydrogen phosphate and phosphoric acid. So in here, I also have phosphoric acid. And the question is, if I have this mixture, which species is the dominant as well as ammonia? I also have ammonia in here, NH4 plus and NH3. So I have this reaction right here. And I'm asking you, when I make this solution go into equilibrium, which chemical is the highest in concentration? Which is the dominant solution, chemical in solution? OK. Or which side does the equilibrium uh, favor? I'll give you another problem. That's um, perbromic acid. Perbromic, it comes from bromate, BrO4. When you put a hydrogen, it's perbromic acid and bromic acid. If I put both of these chemicals into water, which is the dominant chemical in solution. And finally, the last example is if I have acetic acid and the hydrogen cyanide, so what I would do is I would take a beaker over here and I would put vinegar in here, HAC, and hydrogen cyanide, HCN. And I ask you, which chemical in here is the dominant uh, chemical in solution? Okay, that's, that's the homework question. Which one would it be? To answer that question, to answer these types of questions, you need to remember the definition of an acid. The acid is a chemical that is going to give up its hydrogen. Okay, uh, acid is a chemical that is willing to give up its hydrogen. So if I have hydrochloric acid and I put it in water, it's going to produce hydronium and chloride ions. Okay, and this is going to be at 100%. That means HCl is non-existent in water and the dominant chemical because, again, it's going to donate its hydrogen 100% of the time is these two right here at equal amounts. So we can say the dominant chemical in solution for the strong acid is the product because the water, by definition, is the strong acid. I mean, the hydrochloric acid, by definition, is going to dissociate 100%. So that's what you need to do in order to answer these questions. You got to figure out between the two sides here, which is the stronger acid. The stronger acid will, will dictate that the reaction goes in the forward direction relative to where it sits. If H2S is the stronger acid compared to, say, H3O plus, then the reaction will go in the forward direction. If H3O plus is a stronger acid, then the reaction will go in the the reverse direction. Here, the two acids, remember an acid is a proton donor. This right here is the acid. This is the chemical that gives up its hydrogen. So we're comparing this chemical with that chemical. Which is the stronger acid? If this is a stronger acid, we can say that the dominant species are going to be these guys. If this is the stronger acid, the dominant species are going to be this guys. Because remember, strong acid will dictate the flow of the reaction. It's going to try and go in the forward direction. For this reaction right here, we need to compare this acid with this acid. Because the two acids are competing. The two acids are competing for, for hydrogens. Which one is more dominating? Is it the one with four oxygen or the one with three oxygen? I can tell you right now, it's the one with four oxygen. And we'll cover that in that next chapter. 
So the reaction here, because this is the stronger acid, is going to move in the forward direction. The dominant species are these guys. These are the chemicals that are going to be forming because the strong acid is going to dictate that it gives up its hydrogen. Okay, when it gives up the hydrogen, these are the chemicals that are going to be formed. Those are the dominant chemicals in solution. And then finally, we have these this two reaction right here. We're comparing this acid to this acid right here. The dominant acid again <clears throat> will dictate the flow of the reaction. So let me show you this slideshow real quick so that you can see, get an idea of which chemicals the dominant acid. And you can do this by looking up the Ka. So this is the order of the acid strength. And if I have this chart with me, then I can tell you right away in which direction each of these reactions goes to. You can see that hydronium is a stronger acid than H2S. The reaction goes to the left. I can see that um, Phosphoric acid is a stronger acid than ammonia. The reaction goes to the left. I can see that I already know that this is a stronger acid compared to that, okay? The reaction is going to go to the right. And finally, uh, when I'm comparing acetic acid, which is, uh, did I not do? Yeah, here it is, I forgot to include that. Acetic acid compared to hydrogen cyanide, oops, here it is. Acetic acid is a stronger acid, the reaction goes to the right. That's how you answer those questions. And you can do that by looking up the Ka's, okay? This one has a Ka of 7.5 times 10 to the minus three, that's, that's this guy. And the ammonium has a Ka of 5.68 times 10 to the minus 10. 7.5 times 10 to the minus three is a bigger number. It's gonna go in that direction. For these two, I'm looking at these two. The Ka for perbromic acid, well, I couldn't find it, but I know it's a stronger acid because it has four oxygen, okay? But here, the, the last example, the Ka for acetic acid is 1.75 times 10 to minus five, and the Ka for hydrogen cyanide is 4.9 times 10 to minus 10. The reaction moves in the forward direction like that, okay? So there is some looking up of the data in order to answer these types of questions. Okay, there, there's the list right there. If you don't have the KA, you can, you can find the chart that shows you the relative strength. Um, so these are questions that you guys should be able to solve based on what we talked about, uh, amphoteric systems, amphoteric systems, okay? Um, you can try and solve these for next time. 